Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the final part of the France Country Series. This one has taken almost two months to get through, but we're going to end it off on a light note. We're going to end it on Geography Now, France. So we've looked through France from Charlemagne to World War I, and I've done lots of World War II videos as well that has had France in it. So I wasn't going to cover that one specifically, but let's end it on a light note and let's have a look here at Geography Now, France, a country that I have been to a few times now, I think three or four times well, let me think. Yes, I've been there three times now. Um, and I learned French in school because I'm a Canadian. And even though I took French for six years, ich kann auf jeden Fall besser Deutsch als Französisch sprechen, <laughs> which means I can definitely speak better German than French. Um, so I'm not even going to try and embarrass myself and speak French in this intro here. I'm just going to keep it to, to English the whole time. But uh, yeah, so that's that's geography now, France. Let's have a look at it. If you haven't already yet, please remember to like, comment, subscribe. Thank you for joining me on this France Country Series. If you haven't checked it out already, I'll leave a card in the top right. You can see all the videos in the playlist there. Thank you all. Let's get into it. Comme certains d'entre vous le savent, en huitième des mois français, j'ai donc en quelque sorte une obligation de honorer mon héritage. <laughs> it's time to learn geography now! Hey everyone, I'm your host Barbie. Ah, France. Pretty much everybody on the planet has heard of this place. That's I mean, true. immediately images of wine, cafes, embellished 18th century Baroque architecture, and people who really hate globalization of the English language. But take a step <laughs> back even further, and France becomes a place with jaguars, coconuts, volcanoes, penguins, grass skirts, war dances, bamboo flutes, witch doctors, and a multifaceted history that has evolved into a people group into becoming one of the most notable nations on the planet. For sure. Alors, and that's the thing, is like I think I think France sorry, I'm trying to get properly in frame here. I think France really punches above its weight in terms of cultural importance, right? France is a country that has just become absolutely synonymous with its culture. It has a very powerful culture. Um, some might say that it's a very elitist culture, one that's not very accepting of, of tourists or anything. But any time that I've spent in France, it's like, you know, it's fine, right? I've, I've never run into that situation where they go, uh, you know, I won't speak English with you because you're a tourist or whatever. Like, it's, it's fine. It's fine. People, they're friendly there just as they are everywhere else on the planet. Um, but in terms of cultural weight, definitely punch above. I think that French culture and Italian culture are probably... And English culture, to a sense, are probably the most dominant ones in Europe, whereas people are familiar with German culture, but a lot of it's stereotyped just for buy-on and things like this. But yeah, it's kind of a nation with significant uh, importance in that sense. The first thing you just know Let's about go. France is that it's not just European, but a transcontinental country that spans sure. across 12 time zones, more than any other country in the world. Mais comment est-ce que possible? Laissez-moi expliquer, croissant. France is kind of divided into <laughs> two main parts. The European metropolitan France, where about 95% of the population lives, and the overseas French regions, departments, and territories, otherwise known as the département et territoires d'outre-mer, or Dom Tom. Before we tell you what they are, let's explain the difference between them. Regions have exactly the same legal status as mainland France and the same civil, penal code, and administrative social tax laws. However, they can be slightly adapted to suit the region's particular needs. In collectivities, the autonomy rises and they are empowered to make their own laws except in certain areas like defense, currency, trade, and diplomacy. The overseas regions are Guadeloupe and Martinique in the Caribbean, French Guyana in South America, which by the way has the Kuro Space Center, disputably the best in the world because it adds an extra gravitational slingshot effect because it's so close to the equator of the earth and Reunion cool and okay Africa i didn't know that east africa the overseas collectivities are french polynesia you've probably heard of tahiti that's french polynesia as well as wallace and futuna in the pacific saint pierre and michelon right off the coast of canada saint Bar yeah and saint pierre and michelon is what i wanted that that's what i was waiting for, for him to talk about here so saint pierre and michelon is a, is a fascinating place because as he said technically it's france kind of right in a way but it is just off the coast of newfoundland there and um, during the Second World War, they had naval bases there and, and everything like this. But it's kind of a fascinating region because it's 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 very maritime and it's very maritime Canadian traditionally in that sense. But obviously, there's a lot of French speakers there and they have uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You correct me if in the comment section here, but I'm pretty sure that they will they're able to uh, then go work overseas in the European Union because they have that privilege being a part of France, if you will. I might be wrong on that, but. That's at least what I've heard. Might not be true. Let me know below. 
Arlemi and Saint Martin, which is the only place in France that has a border with the Netherlands as the Dutch own the southern part of the island, located all in the Caribbean. The only islands cool. that lie under the title of overseas territories are the French Southern and Antarctic Islands, or the TAAF. These islands are made up of the Cruellen Islands, the Saint Paul and Amsterdam Islands, you can probably guess who used to own those, the Crozet Islands, and Adeliland, the claimed slice of Antarctica that is technically <laughs> not recognized thanks to the Antarctic Treaty. And as of 2000... It's kind of funny how Antarctica is split. So if I remember correctly, I think it's like, it's Argentina, France, the UK, I think the United States, and maybe Russia. They all own these slices of Antarctica. And I'm very much oversimplifying this, but when Antarctica was not really discovered, but was more sort of mapped out, um, all, these ter all these countries were fighting for their influence for new land, thinking that maybe there could be resources or there or something. Um, and so it's split in like this weird circle with little like pie slices belonging to separate countries. Uh, if you ever have a chance, go look at a map on it. Just Google it. It's kind of funny to look at actually of who owns what exactly. And it's basically like an odd shaped, the weirdest pizza, you know, um, for slices out there for who controls those parts of Antarctica. 2007, the scattered islands in the Indian Ocean, remember the Comoros episode, were added to make the I fifth district of the territory, it. even though half of them are disputed with Comoros, Seychelles, and Mauritius. These islands are mostly uninhabited and only house temporary military or scientific personnel. Finally, France administers two special territories that don't quite fall into any of the previously mentioned categories. There's the uninhabited Clipperton Island off the coast of Mexico, which has a crazy murder story behind it. And last but not least, cool. there's the know Caledonia, more about that. which has a special particular status out of the French administered overseas territory. New Caledonia is the only one that's vying for a kind of somewhat independence as the political power was passed to the native Kanak peoples. There is a weird dual French EU and New Caledonian citizenship thing going on. And in 2018, they will hold a referendum to either remain or leave France. Oh, and thanks to all these territories, well, clearly, they together give... Fr well, that clearly happened. So, <laughs> but, I mean, I won't pause it and look it up right now, but okay. I wonder if they're independent or not independent. Okay, France, the cool. the second largest executive economic zone in the world after the U.S. Whew. Okay, now let's go back to metropolitan Europe, France. The country is located in Western Europe, bordered by eight other nation states. Don't forget little Andorra and Monaco. True. Along the coast by the English Channel and the Bay of Biscay in the north and west, as well as the... Monaco is an interesting country. I was there in the summer um, and I saw the entire country in one day because it's, it's not that big. Um, and it's, <laughs> it's insane. So I was with my, my partner at the time and her and I, we were looking at, uh, the, you know, the real estate, like on real estate, um, shops, they have the little, they have the little ads in the windows for what apartments you can buy. The cheapest one that we found was 1.8 million euros. That was the cheapest apartment. They averaged around three to 4 million euros in Monaco. So yeah. And that, that has its whole history. It's tax haven, tax haven, financial haven, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, Monaco is a very interesting country. And if you ever get the chance to, to visit there and you're on an EU plan, don't go to Monaco because they'll charge you 60 euros in data roaming fees. I'm not saying that because it totally happened to me, except for that, yeah, it totally did happen to me. And I was pretty upset about that. Mediterranean Sea to the south. Mainland France is sometimes referred to as the hexagon since if you tilt your head a little bit, it kind of looks like it has six sides. Quite frankly, I was always under the impression that okay. it kind of looked like a teapot with feet. Mainland France <laughs> is also divided into 13 regions, including Corsica Island, 18 altogether if you include the overseas regions, with the capital, largest city, as well as the main cultural and commercial center, Paris. Yep. We could talk on and on about Paris, what with the unbelievably designed metropolitan layout, the rich, vibrant atmosphere, the juxtaposition of classically adorned historical sites along neo-contemporary architecture, the food, the shops, and of course, au soleil, sous la pluie, à midi, au oh, oh, course, il y a tout ce que vous voulez, aux champs -Elysées. But that in itself would take too long, and we gotta get through three more segments. The busiest airports are the two Paris twins, Charles de Gaulle and Orly mm -hmm. International, as well as Nice, Côte d'Azur, and the second and third largest cities, Lyon Saint-Exupéry and Marseille Provence International. At around 640,000 square kilometers, France is the largest country in the EU. The interesting thing about France is that it's kind of divided into areas that historically had their own distinct cultural identity. Some of the most notable ones being Occitania, Savoy, Brittany, Normandy, Alsace, a section of the Basque Country, Nice, and the island of Corsica, which speaks its own dialect most French people can't even understand. These regions contribute their own unique- And it's important to note that Napoleon, one of the most famous French men of all time, came from Corsica. He was not, well, he was born one year after um, the Corsican islands were sold to the French. 
sneak piece of the French pie. Speaking of pie, we all know about French food, which is great because we're gonna discuss more about it in... Before they get to food, I wanna know one thing that's interesting about France. So I was recently looking at some uh, some maps online that showed population density. So it's one of those cool 3D maps where it spikes up where you can see all the population stuff. And it was comparing Italy and France. And Italy, there's quite a large spike in Rome, Milan, in the south there as well, even Napoli or Naples, if you will. Um, Florence and other sort of cities like this. And so it's pretty spread out. You can obviously see where the big cities are, but it's a relatively spread out population. And then you look at France. <laughs> and France, it's just this ginormous spike. Um, and it, it, oh my God, I'm going to screw up the, anyways, the Paris area, the greater Paris area. I'm not even going to say in French because I'm going to screw it up. Um, and then you see the spikes in Marseille. And I believe it's Lyon as well. And those are like the three large spikes there. And then everything else, not as much inhabited. So France is super, super, super centralized around Paris. Um, and that's why, for example, during the Second World War, when Paris fell, that was it. There was no, okay, let's retreat south and try and regroup there. That's it. Once you start, once you strike at the heart of the capital, that's it for the country. If you look at France's physical makeup, you start to kind of understand why food plays such a huge role in their culture. Everything just kind of works out perfectly for them. For metropolitan France, big, rich, nourishing rivers and their tributaries like the Garonne, Dordogne, Loire, Seine, Meuse, and Rhône entangle the entire country north to south, east to west, allowing an abundance of irrigated crop fields to exist in nearly every corner of the country. Now add on top of that the fact that the country does not have any major fault lines. They enjoy a nice oceanic European climate and they don't suffer regularly from any major natural catastrophes. Most of the country is made up of arable cool. flat plains or small rolling green hills that are just begging for cultivation and voila you have an agricultural gold mine in fact out of every country in the eu france reportedly has the highest quality of soil performance and resilience and only a few spots like in the caucasus region and parts of eastern europe and southern russia rank higher so there you go food okay. in the south cool. you reach the mountainous regions of france including the pyrenees along the border with spain the massif central plateaus one of the most geologically studied places in europe due to this strange formation the alps all along the borders with Italy and Switzerland. By the way, Switzerland was all like, mm, yeah, I'm not gonna share Lake Le Mans. It's mine. <laughs> and that's how Geneva was born. The highest point in France, let alone all of the EU, is Mont Blanc, found in the French Alps along the border with Italy, only second in height to the Caucasus Mountains in all of Europe. If you consider the Caucasus region a part of Europe, some people don't, but that's, that's a spicy that's discussion. Story. France is a cornucopia of produce, dairy, and meat. Every region has their own specialty, but two things are everywhere, cheese and wine. The French are the largest consumers of cheese with over 1,200 different varieties varieties found all over the country. The French also have a larger range of unconventionally consumed meat products. Yes. Most countries stick with beef, chicken, pork, maybe lamb or goat and fish. However, the French aren't satisfied with just that. Other animals like pheasant, duck, goose, quail, rabbit, venison, veal, horse, frogs, and snails are consumed regularly. Speaking of which, the national animal is the Gallic rooster, which is why you might typically see a lot of roosters on French affiliated symbols. In fact, France is one of the most entomophagous, that's insect eating, countries in Europe as about 700 million snails are estimated to be consumed every year by the French, especially in Bur I mean, do they really have much competition for that one? I can't think of any other European country that ex that consumes insects on the same level. I don't know. Maybe let me know in the comment section below if, I don't know, maybe, maybe I don't know, Moldova consumes a ton of insects or something. I don't know. Burgundy, or Andorra. the snail producing region in France. Unfortunately, due to the fact that the French are the highest consumers of raw or mildly cooked red meats, a huge portion of the population is either exposed or chronically infected by the Taxoplasma gondii parasite that disputably over half the population is suspected to have. This little guy eventually finds its way into your okay. brain, changes people's behaviors into being either more caring or aggressive and suspicious. So, so it's like The Last of Us? The Alps or, or... are famous for their charcuterie <laughs> and fondue, Brittany for its crepes, Cantal for its chestnuts, Dijon for its mustard, La Veille for Aligo, Rheim for its Champagne, and then we get to Bordeaux. Now, first of all, every region of France likes to claim that they have the best wine. However, it's widely known that Bordeaux is disputably the home yes. of the largest wine vineyards and in then the world, pumping out well. over half a billion liters of wine a year. The French take their produce maintenance very seriously and became the first country in the world to ban supermarkets from throwing away or destroying unsold food since February of 2016. All cool. businesses must donate wastage to either charities or food banks. To combat crop wastage on farms, France has even opened up ugly fruit or vegetable shops 
shops in which you can buy disfigured produce for 30% off. Other than foodstuffs though, main exports are aircraft, chemicals, machinery, iron, and steel, electronics, motor vehicles, and pharmaceuticals. Of course, the overseas territories and regions also have climates and topographies that are completely different. The Caribbean islands and Guyana enjoy a warm Caribbean tropical climate, Guyana being part of the Amazon, having one of the highest forest cover densities in the world at over 95%, with over 1,100 cool. species of birds and reptiles and mammals found in it. Reunion and Mayotte off the coast of Africa have deep jungle ravines and a common volcanic activity going on. The scattered islands are mostly uninhabited, sandbanks and lagoons with nothing more than just a few trees and shrubs. The southern Antarctic islands are rocky and desolate with few grasses and vegetation. Kerwellen has these cabbage looking things going on. And these islands typically freeze over in the winter with penguins stampeding off the coasts. New Caledonia and French Polynesia are tropical Pacific islands that enjoy an abundance of rich, unspoiled, thick jungle brush and colorful flowers. And of course, Adelie Land is like all ice and Antarctica. All right, we've discussed borders, oh, so it just looks like boundaries, North Canada. mountains, food, volcanoes. Now let's talk about who's running the entire show. France is a country of people that are very, very intent on making sure that you know they are French. First of all, the country has about 67 million people and is the second largest in Europe after Germany, making 13% of the EU alone. About 85% of the population is white, 10% are North African, mostly from the Maghreb regions, a little over 3% are black, and a little less than 2% are Asian. The currency is the euro, they really? the type CEF hmm. outlets, okay. and they drive on the right side of the road, which makes things interesting when their neighbors from the UK come across the channel. Now let's talk about the white people. Most white French people have some or partial. Yeah, so for those <laughs> don't know what the channel is, the channel is, a, is an underground tunnel that runs underneath the English Channel. So you can actually drive from France to the UK. Pretty cool. I want to do it one of these years, but haven't quite had the, uh, what would you say, the opportunity to do so yet. Celtic or Gaulish origins as historically the Gauls inhabited most of the centralized regions of modern day France. That means genetically the French and British have a lot more in common than they think. Of course, an yeah, admixture of, course. of Latin and Germanic roots also applies as all three people groups had their stake of claim in France as well. The name France even came from the Germanic Frank tribe. Yep. French is of course the official language, however. Yeah, and it's important to note too that English kings for the longest time up until Henry IV, um, French was the, was the language that was spoken in the court. Right. There was a lot of ancestry, too, between these nobles um, that a lot of them had French ancestry. And even to this day, I believe some of the kings that are still on the throne, if you will, in a constitutional monarch sense, also can trace their roots back to having French heritage as well. So, yeah, it's an important nation in that sense. And a lot of uh, royal dynasty and lineage can be traced back to the French as well. Regional dialects. Oh, and if they're not French, then they're German. That's another thing too. Do exist, but for the most part, they do pretty well at making sure everyone speaks it. Granted, the linguistic zones that we mentioned before each have their own flag, still cling on to their mother tongue, and sometimes you can even find street signs written in these languages. For example, Breton, a Celtic-based language related to Welsh and Irish, found in Brittany. Basque in the Basque country. Occitan in Occitania. Corsicans have like this strange half French, half Italian hybrid thing going on. Keep in mind though, most of the languages spoken in the linguistic zones are kind of dying out, and only the older generation mm, retains yeah. daily conversation in those languages. Outside of metropolitan France, the overseas departments and territories each speak French, but in a Honestly, I think that's kind of unfortunate, really, is that as time goes on, these languages will start to die off, and I kind of wonder, it's like, how it's only young people that can really save them. I mean, I guess you could have government intervention to try and save these languages, but uh, I don't know. I think that's kind of a shame, though. In addition, typically have their own creoles or dialects. For example, in the Caribbean, Martinique and Guadeloupe might say Saka marché, tout bon man, timal man. In Reunion or Mayotte, they might say Coiffé, comment il est, à où? France is the most visited country cool. in the world, as more people than the entire population of France visit France annually at about 80 million. <laughs> Culture-wise, there is too much to discuss. I mean, we are talking millennia of tribes, yep. wars, empires, heroes, villains, artists, poets, architects, kings, queens, guillotines, revolutions, inventions, music, dance, Dance, clothing, fashion, cinema, cuisine, discoveries, victories, losses, folklore, science, literature, medicine, and baguettes. To cover it all, we would need a whole separate YouTube channel. But for what it's worth, yep. since the Middle Ages, France has been able to show time after time again that it has been a global force to be reckoned with. And there's one important thing too. So during the France Country series, I asked you guys, um, what percent of conflicts has France won and what percent have they lost? And if I remember the comment correctly, and if you're watching this now, thank you very much for writing this one out. Um, I think it was 72% of all the conflicts that France has ever been in, they've won, 
which is pretty impressive, all things considered. Considering at some points, especially during the French Revolution, they were fighting the entire continent, right? During the French Revolution, during the Napoleonic Wars. Um, and so obviously the most famous, uh, I would think the most famous loss for France was obviously in the Second World War, where they were defeated in mere months by the German army. Um, France overall has had a pretty impressive win record, if you will. I mean, the French at one point in time had the second largest empire in the world, spanning across virtually yep. every region on every continent. One thing yeah. you have to and understand that was, is that in a fast... And that map that he just showed, that was during the height of Napoleon's power. Um, when, yeah, exactly. France was the second largest empire in the world, just rivaled to the British Empire, of course. Growing Anglophone-driven global economy, France is very, very firmly intent on preserving the French language and culture. The governmentally Quebec. sanctioned Académie Française has aimed at doing this since mm. 1634. They do things... Yeah, so this is... Oh, I'll let him finish. Hold things on. like, somewhat unsuccessfully, banning foreign words... One sec. ...such as blog, hashtag, parking, email, and weekend. In addition, the French media's top regulators, the CSA and CNC, have strictly enforced policies that require all music on private radio to be at least of 40% French origin and 70% in the French language between the hours of 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., and half the music quota must be less than six months old. Everything must be French. Fr and so I want to talk a little bit about that. So the Académie de uh, Français, sorry if I'm screwing that up, is it's kind of cool because it's a centralized, um, it's a centralized institution that dictates language for the country. And I think that's really, really interesting. Like, can you imagine if we had in, in Canada or the UK or the United States, an institute that dictates the English language? It doesn't really exist. English in the sense, if you will, is sort of a decentralized language where it's constantly evolving. There's always new words. And with the amount of English speakers that exist in the world, it's a very flowing, um, very unique uh, language in that sense, right? As well as German to German, for example, is also decentralized in this way. Yes, there's the Duden, but um, this doesn't have actual power, right? Whereas this academy actually does sort of have power and tries to keep French to be a sort of centralized language, if you will, one that can be sort of official French in, in that sense. And as he said, they ban new words like selfie and whatever and things like this, um, as well as with French music. Um, we have that in Canada as well. It's called CanCon, where I believe it's also about 50 percent of all the music that needs to be on the radio has to be of Canadian origin. And so within the uh, I was about to say the state, the province of Quebec, this is also CanCon comes into effect. But then there's also French CanCon, right, where they needs to be Canadian and in the French language. Um, and so. I mean, I, I've done videos before talking about Quebec and, and about Quebec separatism and Quebec independence and everything like this. But um, the preservation of the French language is one of the most, what would you say? It's one of the tenets that really Quebec is subscribing to and trying to keep alive. And whether you think that's right or whether you think that's wrong, that's up for debate. France is, of course, home to a plethora of notable figures in every field of academia and athleticism. I mean, they have almost 70 Nobel Peace Prize winners, including famous chemists Pierre and Marie Curie. Few people know that they had a daughter who also became a notable scientist. Other scientists, writers, oh. and philosophers like Descartes, Pascal, Baudelaire, Flaubert, Pasteur, Châtelet, Bouton, who, by the way, invented the metric system. Musicians like Ramelot, Lully, Debussy, Jacques Brel, Edith yep. Piaf. Of course, we can't forget the fashion icons Louis Vuitton, Coco Chanel, and Christian nah. Duart. I mean, it's no secret. France is often touted as the fashion capital of the world. Artists also a Nazi sympathizer. Like Monet, Cezanne, Renoir, Degas, Manet, and Gauguin. And of course, what's an episode about France without mentioning anything about kings Louis XIV and XVI, Joan of Arc, and Napoleon? In a simple way of putting it, French culture is very vibrant and proud. The French love where they've come from and how they go about doing things. The Catholic Church once played a major role, and to this day, <laughs> even as a secular state with dwindling church attendees, many French people still, in the very least, identify nominally as Catholic, mostly for a cultural thing. It's just their history, and they don't want to toss it away. They also love taking... It's much complicated than that, but <laughs> if you want, go check out the France Country Series, as I said before. And that's all covered during the French Revolution um, in oversimplified videos. If you want to go check those out, there's more information there. ...breaks and getting their sleep. On average, the French get about 8.83 hours of sleep every day, more than any other country in the developed world. And they also have some of the sure. shortest work weeks with only about six to seven hours on average a day. And that's enough for them. It's not uncommon to see people taking time off in the middle of the day, early evening, just to relax and take a nap. They even have a work all for, for that. Little de Why la not? Parole, which literally translates to the hour of the aperitif. People can also claim state pension at age 62, making it one of the lowest retirement ages in the world. And of course, the sport French people rank highest in the world... 
going on strike. I mean, the last thing you want to do is interrupt a Frenchman's nap during a six-hour shift with corporate policy changes. Yep, the world can be a cruel, <laughs> cruel place. Let's see how France survives in the jungle. When it comes to France, they don't discriminate. They hate everyone equally. No, but seriously, France has their eyes on a few people, and when they see what they like, they cling on and make you a treasure. First of all, Francophone nations and Latin-based former Roman legacy nations generally get the high seats, especially their neighbors like Switzerland, Luxembourg, Italy, and Spain. Quebec, Canada is to France kind of like what the USA is to the UK. They adore each other, they love each other's mm, accents, they love making fun okay. of each other even more, even though they are really close. Algeria, yeah. Morocco, and Tunisia are the closest African nations. Okay, I, I, don't, I don't really agree with that depiction. Uh, Okay, I would say that do they really make fun of each other. Ugh. Sort of. So Quebec is actually so. Okay, let's dial it back a little bit here. So once, um, basically, the French lost the war for North America during the Seven Years' War, and then Britain basically established a hegemony, and then you had Quebec, which was French-speaking peoples, and they wa they wanted to preserve their own culture and their own way of life. Okay, cool. That's the <laughs> background story to it. Um, so French France and that sorry France. Quebec in that way was sort of an isolated culture for a very long time. So for example, in Quebec, and again, I might not be 100% on this, please correct me in the comment section. Um, within Quebec is that they sort of speak more of a, I want to say Hochfranzösisch, which is German, but like a high French. And it becomes sort of that cultural isolation over the years that developed that. So they do have their own unique dialect, right? There is the Quebecois dialect. Some people say it sounds harsh. To me, I don't really hear too much of a difference, but I'm also not a you know, I'm not a French speaker, but it doesn't sound too different. But in that sense, Quebec did, was for a very long time, culturally isolated from France. And that had an impact on the language and the culture and everything. And I don't really think that France sort of sees it as the United States in that way, that they were separate due to an independence war. And then they had a tough time, right? And then they became friends later, but rather they just lost the war. And Quebec is sort of held on right to a lot of those French ideas and a lot of those French values um, and which obviously had a massive impact on the creation of Canada and basically Canada since then and continues to have an impact so I don't really agree with that assessment but hey let me know what you think down below as they make up the largest African immigrant demographics, followed by sub-Saharan African countries like Cameroon and Côte d'Ivoire, or Ivory Coast. For France, Japan is seen as like the epitome of exoticism. Similar to themselves, the Japanese have a rich culture of noble tradition, things like castles, attire, and food. Likewise, Japan sort of shares the same mutual fascination and see France as like its European alternate universe oh, twin. There's no okay. two countries that cool. like to poke fun of and borderline harass each other with the French as the UK and the USA. As Historical rivals for Definitely the, UK. the UK. I mean, yep. they did have a hundred year war with them, and the USA busting their chops about World War II all the time. All sides like to satirize each other in cartoons and media all the time. Nonetheless, they are actually really close. The UK and France have been crossing borders. And I mean, I think the funniest example of that, well, yeah, okay. One of the most interesting examples of that was when uh, during the Iraq War in 2000, oof, 2003, 2004, anyways, within, during the Iraq War, um, <laughs> In the United States, they tried to change uh, French fries, like calling them French fries, to freedom fries. And there was sort of a grassroots movement to change this because France uh, obviously declined to invade Iraq. Um, the British did, but the French did not. Canada also did not, fun fact. Um, but yeah, there's sort of this. So you can see some old, if you look it up on YouTube, you can see some old news footage of, you know, the change from French fries to freedom fries and being interviewed and... Yeah, it's kind of a funny little time capsule of, of how it was back then. ...is an intermarrying for centuries, commerce and student exchanges are high, and the U.S. was helped by the French during the Revolutionary War, and they even gave the Statue of Liberty as a present. So fellow Americans, thank yes. France and for Lady not, Liberty, okay? Key point, it's not the only Statue of Liberty too. There's more than one. It was a kind gesture. France's best friends, though, would probably be Germany and Belgium. It's kind of funny because historically, the only country that was consistently Germany? an opponent of eh, France was Germany. Okay. Ever since the split of Charlemagne's empire in three, most of Europe's history was driven by the overarching rivalry between variations of France and all variations of Germany, including the Holy Roman Empire, the Teutonic mm, Order, Russia, okay. and of course, the Third Reich. But the plot twist was the creation of the EU. Okay. Following Robert sure. Schuman's speech that states explicitly that for Europe to even hope to work, the millennia-old rivalry between France 
France and Germany has to be resolved for yep. good. Ever since 1950, France and Germany have taken a lot of political inspiration off of each other. Heads of states have visited each other on numerous occasions, and True. both countries yep. have been the biggest advocates for the survival of the Union. And Belgium yeah. is like their little brother that moved out and got a Dutch-speaking roommate and visits France every so often to raid their fridge and do their laundry. In conclusion, les Français sont connus pour être intrépides, turbulents, mais qui gardent quand même un certain charme. Ils ont parfois l'air des symboles, mais bon, essaye de vivre dans un pays envahi 24 heures sur 24, <laughs> 7 jours sur 7, par des hordes de touristes yeah. qui piétinent vos jardins, massacrent votre gastronomie, et vous demandez de vous plaire au moindre de leurs désirs, sans même vous dire un petit merci. Oh, France, faut le comprendre. Stay tuned. France's rich <laughs> former little colony, Gabon, is coming up next. Cool. Well, thank you very much for joining me on this one. That was fun. That was much more lighthearted. I hope I was able to inform you guys on a bit, little bit of the history of France. And uh, yeah, we had, a, we had an interruption too, which is what happens when you, when you live at home and there's five other people here. And usually in my apartment, anyways... Thank you very much for joining me on this one. Thank you for joining me in the France Country Series. I'm going to take a break for a bit. I'm going to do some videos on other on other topics, excuse me, and then the next one up will be Deutschland, and I can talk a lot about Germany. So we'll get into that. Thank you all very much for your support. I appreciate it. Take care. All the best. And I hope you, yeah, I hope you come to the next video. I was going to say, I hope I see you in the next video. That makes no sense. See you guys later. Goodbye.